temperature affects powder burn and resultant velocity. How much? We're gonna explore that in this video. Gavin Gay here from UltimateReloader.com. I'm back with Travis Fox. Thank you for joining us, Travis. Hi, Gavin. Thanks for having me. Good to see you guys. Finally, it's here. It is here, our extreme temperature sensitivity testing for powders, part one. Part one, here we go. What did we learn? Well, temperature affects powder burn rate and it does not affect it in the ways that you might expect. So we're gonna get to the data. Before that, let's talk, let's set the stage by talking about the powders and kind of the process. Sure. So we've got two powders here. We've got Varget. Varget is an extruded powder. Varget is a part of Hodgson's Extreme lineup, which is specifically formulated for temperature stability, hence picking it for this test. And we wanted to put that up against another powder that doesn't have the same emphasis on temperature stability, which is? The TAC, Ramshot TAC. Yeah. So the thing is with both of these powders, I have had great luck with both of them shooting the 308 mm -hmm. and other cartridges. Very accurate, works very, very well. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting to see what temperature can do to these powders. Yeah. Varget has just got a long standing record. TAC has a great record with people in progressive presses. Yeah. It flows super well, super nice. But let's discuss the differences that we found. Okay, so the load. Let's talk about your load. Picking a cartridge, picking load data to try and make this kind of as apples to apples as it can yep. be with, with temperature as the main variable. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to get the case volume pretty close to the same and then try and get the, the starting velocities at room temperatures at 70 degrees mm -hmm. and see if we get things leveled out, a level playing field, which mm -hmm. we did. We were able to get 42 grains of the TAC and 42 and a half grains of the Varget. This gave me a 90% load for the TAC and a 93% load for the mm -hmm. Varget, I believe. And the velocities, the baseline velocities were within 60, 70 feet per second, I believe. So you chose 308 Winchester. What led you down that path? <laughs> Very popular cartridge. I know yep. a few guys that like that cartridge, mm -hmm. like a lot of you out there do. It's just kind of the workhorse. This rifle is like my test workhorse. You know, it has enough powder in there that I thought maybe with this temperature testing, we might see uh, a bigger shift versus say a 223 case because it's got, you know, lower volume. But the reality is in some of the study I did, that actually doesn't really matter. So you could probably run this test with multiple cartridges and you'd come up with the same percentages of differences that mm -hmm. we did. But I do like running the 308, you know. It's a good median cartridge. It's kind of right yeah. in the middle there. It's something everyone is likely to be familiar with. There's a Very lot so. of load data out there. I think personally, it was a good choice. Next, let's talk about formulating the test process. So here's where we started. I did a little conversation with Hodgson Powders, trying to find out what they're doing for their testing. Did a little research on the internet with what NATO and the military does mm -hmm. and their range of testing that they're utilizing. Mm -hmm. And we learned a number of things. So the baseline that they're doing is 70 degrees. So they, they take their cartridge for NATO testing, 70 degrees. Fahrenheit? Fahrenheit, yes, good point. <laughs> Room um, temperature, more or less. <laughs> and they want to test for, they're testing for function mm -hmm. of the firearm. They're testing for safety of the firearm and pressure. Mm -hmm. So then they, they use that as their baseline parameter. Then they go down to minus 65 Fahrenheit mm -hmm. and they do their function test there also. And they also test at 240, which we're gonna talk more about that later. <laughs> 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So they're not necessarily testing for accuracy. They're not necessarily testing for anything else other than function and safety for the, for the operator of the yep. weapon. Yep. So what do we learn on that? Well. It's pretty simple with some dry ice to get them down to that temperature mm -hmm. and to use a toaster oven to get them up to 140. So here's what we did. I loaded them all in a magazine. Mm -hmm. I loaded five rounds of the loads in the tack and the Varget into a magazine, put them in a cooler of dry ice with the temp probe in there. And then we let that whole thing cold soak. Now they do get a little condensation on them and as soon as you touch them, dry ice will burn your skin. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to handle that. Had gloves on. 
So I wanted to be able to have the magazine soaked. I didn't want to have to handle the cartridge to get any heat transfer from my hands or anything else. So I figured if it was in the magazine, that'd be kind of a little bit of a, kind of a barrier, kind of a container, yeah, yeah for sure. everything. So and we had everything right there together. So we had everything set up and pull it out of the dries, temperatures where it needs to be, mm -hmm. throw it in the rifle, take my five shots. I let the rifle cool down in between each session also. Mm -hmm. I didn't want the chamber affecting any of those, any of that testing sure. either. Sure, you want to keep that dwell time down, right? Yes. Of it sitting Very in much. the chamber, conducting heat to the cartridge or from the cartridge to the chamber. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that all went very simply. Uh, we did that fine. The 70 degree test, pretty basic. We're yeah. just running it all at room temperature. We threw that down range. And then the toaster method that we did with a little toaster oven that we had was able to have, I've got a digital temp gauge that, that I work for, mm -hmm. use for smoking meats, which mm, I love smoked meat. <laughs> um, anyway, the one thing I did is we loaded the mags again because yep. I wanted that whole thing to be soaked to that temperature. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get my probe down inside the mag so I could really monitor that. Nice. And it was interesting that the exterior got warm and it did take quite a while for the for the mag to the, the cartridges to get to temperature. And how accurate was the dial on the, the toaster oven? <laughs> it actually it actually was not that bad, but it's brand new, so yeah. you know maybe that has a little bit to do with it here. Sure. We'll see when we get a few burritos in it if it stays there. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we're not eating out of that same uh, oven. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> so anyway we got the temp probe is down yep. in there. And then I did the same exact thing where we quickly go out to the rifle, mm -hmm. throw the round just down range, mm -hmm. and we get we get our chronograph testing. Yeah, here we're using the, the Caldwell G2. This is one of these chronographs that just keeps coming out because of the app. The app is works yeah. so well over Bluetooth. You can very easily on your phone name your groups, and then as soon as I'm done shooting a group, I email it to myself. And then we have a very prescribed way of copying and pasting the table yep. out of the preview into Google Sheets, and it just it just works really yeah, seamlessly. It, it is one of the more user-friendly chronographs that I've ever used. And if you're shooting straight down the middle and have decent lighting, you're not going to get dropped shots either, yeah. like you'll get with some types of chronographs. Every chronograph has its pros and cons, but yeah, yeah this one just keeps coming out. This we keep one, it set up on a tripod, actually, here at Ultimate yeah. Loader. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> It gets worked out yep. often. So that was how that test went. Um, let's very talk simple. About, let's talk about the rifle real quick. Well, this is the, it's a Bighorn Origin with mm -hmm. a factory Savage barrel that I've threaded onto there. What length and what twist rate? This is a 22, one in 10. Okay. And then I've got it plunked into the XLR magnesium element chassis that we have the weight kit on. I know magnesium chassis with a weight kit doesn't make a lot of sense, but <laughs> it does. It, it does because you can go light. Well, the and thing then is, you can bring it back up to up well, to weight, right? The thing is, you can also put the weights where you want them in the chassis, yep. so it balances it. So yep. there's actually less weight in the back than there is hmm. up front, and it just sits right on top of a tripod flat. Mm -hmm. Looks pretty nice. Yeah, these chassis that we have that have the Remington 700 inlet typically see a lot of different rifles yes. getting swapped in and out. It's yeah. very handy. I've run my uh, 22 trainer, the Voodoo 22 trainer on this thing. Mm -hmm. We've had the, yeah, multiple things. Running the Athlon Ares BTR on here. Mm -hmm. Another great workhorse scope that we yep. have here at Ultimate Reloader. So yeah, it, it works really well. Love shooting this thing. It, uh, like I say, you guys have seen other trainer videos that we've done in the past on this and uh, get you good recoil management on this, on this mm -hmm. gun. Okay, so with that, it's time to talk data. So I was actually out of town getting Cerakote training while you guys did the work and came back to some data in a spreadsheet and there's always that nerd moment, right? When you get your graph put together <laughs> and you see, you know, it's looking at numbers is one thing, but seeing a picture yeah. is another thing entirely. Now, what did you expect to see? What were you thinking? What did I expect to see? Oh, I don't know. I. I honestly expected the Varget to have more of a, an effect from the temperature. I expected it to have an, a, bit, a bigger increase in velocity, and mm -hmm. it didn't. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of thought that the TAC might have more velocity also with more temperature, and it really didn't. So I guess that tells me that my brain is stuck back in however many years back when we really had bigger velocity changes due to temperature. Mm -hmm. So you're saying they were kind of both better than you thought? They were both better than I thought. Okay. The Varget definitely better than I thought. Okay. I have some 
images in my head of a match I shot in probably 10 years ago where uh, one of my friends was shooting a 223 AR and mm -hmm. he was shooting over the top of the targets like crazy in the afternoon because it ended up getting to be about like 95 degrees oh, yeah. in the afternoon. Right. And he just like his data was just off huge. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm still stuck back in then. I think that there's been great strides forward with powder manufacturers mm -hmm. in getting these powders much more stable at temperature. So that said, we did see some pretty significant differences. Let's look at the graph. Okay, so here the red line is the Varget. So we had slightly higher velocity overall and the blue line is the tack. And what we're looking at here is kind of the slopes, right? If we had no temperature sensitivity and we're perfectly temperature stable, we would see a straight line all the way across. Flat. One a little bit lower, one a little bit higher, right? Because of the average velocity. You can see here that for Varget, we had a very slight increase with an increase in temperature and we had a more drastic increase with the tack. Now note here that we're looking at a very small sliver of the graph. If we started at zero and went up to 3000 feet per second, we're looking at this little band here. So what looks like a pretty steep line here is, is maybe not as steep as it appears, right. but what we do see very clearly is the fact that Hodgson's extreme powder, Varget in this case, definitely performed better than its counterparts. So this is one of those cases where you need to balance the trade-offs of if you're doing 223, for instance, 22 caliber case mouth. That's a very small opening for powder to go through. Varget may bridge on you in a progressive situation if you're trying to load really fast, whereas yeah. tack will meter really, really well. If you're gonna be out, and I love this temperature range actually. It will get down to negative 65 up in Alaska. Yep. And it will get up easily up to 140. Any black magazine sitting in the yeah. sun in 100 degree weather would, would easily get up to that. So we did that while we were out there. Yep. Uh, I had a mag sitting out there and I went, oh, this is warm. So I said, I purposely left it out there. It was a black mm -hmm. plastic mag. I purposely mm -hmm. left it there for a while. Took our little infrared test thermometer to it and it was up to 95 degrees. And I sat there for a minute and punched it again. And it went all the way up to like 112. And it was only like 65, I think, that day. So imagine if you're in Nevada or southern Utah, Arizona, mm -hmm. whatever, and you leave your mag in your car. And then you go out and you like, you know, you see a coyote running by or something like that. You throw it in your gun. You're going to get a, a change in your yeah. point of impact for sure. Yeah, definitely. Let's take a look at the actual numbers here. So with this chart, we can see all of the different velocities. And I wanna point out two things here. The first is the total change. From negative 65 all the way to 140 for TAC, we had 169 feet per second total. And then for Varget, across negative 65 all the way to 140, we had 50 feet per second. Not much. That is a lot better stability. Yeah. So in terms of the overall slope of the line, for TAC, we had 0.8 feet per second gain, 0.824 per degree Fahrenheit. And for Varget, we had 0.243. So we can look at this a little bit different. One of the things I noticed was as the temperature was increasing, the rate of change of velocity actually picked up. Yeah. So it's kind of a, a nonlinear curve. And we have three data points, so we only have two sections in the curve. I thought it'd be kind of interesting to compare the steeper slope versus the shallower slope for either. So for Varget, we actually had 2.6 times the slope on the hotter portion compared to the cooler portion. And for TAC, we had 1.9 times the slope. So it picked up a little bit more gradually actually compared to the Varget, but, but the Varget was so temperature insensitive, so right. stable that it didn't really show up as much. Are these numbers particularly meaningful? Uh, maybe not, but those ratios are in the same ballpark at least. And what would be interesting to do for follow-up would be to gather more data points. Might yeah. not be practical for every test that we do. Right. But but it, it would give you more information and it might tell you where that exponential growth is going to be. Yeah. Which end of the temperature scale are you going to see those factors? And, and that may potentially where you're going to use that powder at. Mm -hmm. You know, summertime, yep. wintertime, et cetera, et cetera. So what else did we learn on this? Well, I'm going to go back to the, your anecdote about the match, uh, oh. about the guy shooting over the targets. Yep. 
uh, I was shooting 22 nozzler in a match and I tested my rifle and my load, which was very hot by the way, in probably 90 degree weather. And in the match, the Finlay Cup that I competed in with this gas gun, the mag was sitting out in the sun. It was 96 plus, it was pushing 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And with that solar heating and with the increased air temperature, I had functioning issues. Oh, sure. I was, I was over pressure. I think the cases weren't, you know, they were not extracting properly or whatever sure. it was. It was jamming. And uh, so the moral of the story is know what temperature ranges you're going to be operating under and then plan your loads accordingly. So this is a the, great hunting scenario. Yeah, I it feel is like. very much so. This is And hunting scenario also, but we go back to the match thing again. I don't want to <laughs> harp just on the match thing. But this is where a lot of guys, especially the PRS guys that are traveling all around mm -hmm. the country, mm -hmm. and they're, you know, you may be shooting in uh, eastern Washington, Idaho, where it's dry, mm -hmm. right? But then you have to go to the east coast or southeast for a match where humidity level's higher and the temperature is higher. Mm -hmm. You cannot run your six dasher on the ragged edge because you're going to get down there in the rain and you're going to be blowing primers. Yep. It's not going to function. Moisture right definitely you. affects pressure. Has to do with the the airspace in the chamber. Things seal up a little bit more. There's a little bit yep. less room in there. Pressures elevate. You know, when you're on that ragged edge, like you're saying, there's not a lot of margin. Yeah. So while we're testing this stuff and we're running these cartridges at you know, 90% capacity, 95% capacity, keep this in mind when you're loading and what conditions you're shooting on. Mm -hmm. It's there's no reason to be running all the way bumping up against mm -hmm. that edge all the time. It's a good thing to come back down a little bit. Give yourself a margin of safety. Yep. And also know that this should be somewhat predictable. So if you're going to be shooting over the targets at a particular temperature and shooting under them at, at a lower temperature, that is something that you could potentially anticipate and account for in your dope calculations and your overall shooting strategy. Yep. So if you're shooting in the desert and it's below freezing in the morning and then it gets up to over 100 degrees in the afternoon, I don't know, maybe Pete Milan runs into that. I don't know if it gets that cold in South Africa. I know around here, some yeah. of our desert areas, the swings are rather wide, you know, yes, definitely, definitely definitely something uh, to think about. Also, what about primers? So, okay, yeah, we should have backed up on this. <laughs> Here's a really good point. On this test, on any temperature test, you are also testing the primer at the same time. So while we tested these two powders, we're also testing mm -hmm. that primer. If we would have run one powder and two different primers, we could have seen a difference also because the primer has a huge effect on the ignition of that powder. The, the heat of the primer and then also its own inherent temperature sensitivity, yes, which I exactly. haven't even thought about until this moment. Yeah. That's that's an interesting thought. So that, that could play into it. That could be a test we could do sometime in the future maybe. Uh, we take two different primers, one powder, and do the mm -hmm. same temperature test on them. That'd be very interesting. Definitely. And this is yet another technology that we're making major investments in here at Ultimate Reloader. We've got commercial.ultimatereloader.com where we're working with other companies, law enforcement agencies, and, and the military. And so if this is of particular interest, you can go over there and use our contact form to get in contact with us. We will be putting into place more formal testing procedures, going back to Hodgdon, reviewing what the military is doing, and really trying to align our data to those results so that if we happen to find data from the military or if you're comparing data and want an apples to apples you know alignment of that data that's that's really what we're striving towards plus whatever Hodgdon and related companies are are doing internally very interesting research thank you for taking the baton on this and pioneering yeah. in this space we've Glad got to do it. I think more money to spend if you look at those <laughs> ultra cold freezers they're uh, they're uh, not cheap. Yeah, but, uh, you, the dry ice thing was kind of, uh, <laughs> it'd be nice to have a freezer. Yeah, something to throw it in the night before and then grab it out and go. And, and then dial cold. it to the temperature you wanted to. Maybe we need a really big one so we could put the whole rifle in there too. Good idea. <laughs> All in good time. Uh, here's what we want to know is what have you seen with powders over wide temperature swings? Have you done any testing do you have any anecdotal hunting stories or match shooting or target shooting sh stories to share? Drop a comment and let's start a discussion on this. That concludes this video and that means it's time to wrap it up. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. Also, make your voice heard. If you have something to say, 
please drop a comment. Make sure you're subscribed with notifications because you're not gonna wanna miss the awesome content that is coming up. And finally, flex your reloading pride. You could look great in one of these t-shirts. We've got multiple designs at the Ultimate Reloader store. I'll see you later because I'm off to go shooting. Thank you.